Hi, Pastor Mike Chandler here. I wanna thank you for tuning in and let you know that we have other resources for your spiritual journey on our website. But just a quick reminder before we begin, while resources like this and others can be helpful for growing in the ways God has ordained for you, they are no replacement for gathering with your local church on Sundays. So we do encourage you to use them, but in full participation with your local church. If you're not currently connected somewhere, you're always invited to Grace Point. Visit our website, gracepointstcloud.com for time and location, and we hope to see you soon. One week from today, next Sunday, we will celebrate five years of our daughter, Cadence, who we call Katie, uh, being part of our family. Melanie went out Friday night, and we uh, celebrated that with her, as we do every year. Um, uh, is she hiding? Okay. Yeah, she's hiding. No one can see her anymore. She shrank down so small. Um, we, and we do that every year. When we just use it as a time of celebration and reflection. Think of it like a birthday, but it's your gotcha day. It's the day your parents got got you from the orphanage or from your foster parents, and you became in their full-time custody. And um, it just feels like yesterday that we were getting on a plane and passing through uh, New York and on our way to New Delhi, which was a very long, very grueling flight, the longest flight I've ever been on. I think it was 14 or 15 hours. And I know there are longer, but that is a long time. And uh, we, we just rushed through everything we could to get all the way to Kolkata on another shorter flight on, a, um, on another plane. And the, the morning of, we woke up and tried to be casual, just go casually get breakfast at the hotel, you know, and, and just, you know, go back up to the room and wait. And then they called us and said, oh, we actually need, to, need you to wait three more hours and come a little later. And we thought, oh, are you kidding me? It's killing us. We've waited four years, two months, and 30, and 30 or in 20 something days at this point. Are you, are, three more hours? Are you kidding me? You're killing me. So we're in the hotel. I'm pacing back and forth, and she's journaling. That's how we both dealt with it. But we both felt like we were in the waiting room at a hospital, waiting for a, a birth to come. And um, eventually, we finally came time. Okay, we get in a taxi. We drive only about a mile. It was very close from the orphanage to the hotel. To, to the hotel where we were. And we sat down in an office and we waited and waited and waited for the moment. And then the moment came, not because any adult came in the room, but we saw this little face peer around the corner. Someone had clearly told us, your mommy and daddy are here, go see them. And they didn't guide her into the room because they wanted us, I guess, to have a moment alone with her. And she just peered around the corner. We didn't get it on footage. If I had had a camera, I would have wanted to snap that moment, but I think it's because God just wanted that to be right in here for our whole life. She just looked around the corner, smiled and giggled and ran away. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then eventually someone made her come in and she hugged us and we, there were lots of tears and there's a video online. You can find it if you want to be part of that and, and see what it was like. Uh, but we, we eventually, find, finally the time came after being there for a while, came time to leave. So she took us by the hand and walked us out. We thought we'd have to drag her out, and we were told by social workers, be ready for this to be a very difficult time where your child might scream, and you're gonna have to grab the child and rip them away from their life. Because at that last moment, they might just not want to go because it's all they've known. Even though they want a family, they might not be willing to go. And she just walked right out and said, bye, grabbed, <laughs> grabbed me by the hand. We walked out to the taxi. She got right in, smiling, playing with the dog, the little stuffed animal that her three brothers had bought for her. And we were just, here's a picture of us. This is pulling away from the orphanage. You can see, now that building in the back is the orphanage. Like, we have not pulled away yet, and we're all just like, <laughs> look how great that went. No tears? But then there were some tears very quickly after this. Mom and I were sobbing. And uh, we thought, okay, now what? <laughs> it's time to start parenting. Okay, we got to feed her. We got to clothe her. We got to teach her. We got to guide her. It's time to actually begin the work. After such a long wait and feeling like you're, there's no movement, we went from no movement to now you got a kid. And she's seven. And she doesn't speak English at all. And go for it. So we excitedly got out Google Translate and started working on it, figuring out how to communicate. And uh, that is a great illustration for what it's like when God takes this unknown group of people out of slavery in Egypt, makes them his, and they get past the Red Sea and they respond in how? In worship. And now what? It's time for God to start parenting them. 
It's time to get to the work of being their king. And he immediately goes to work on them. There is, and, and we did immediately start parenting her and correcting and guiding and no, 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 and here, this instead, and all of that stuff immediately happened because she needed a parent. She needed a mom and daddy, and boy, was she brave and gentle in putting up with our correction somehow. But we started parenting her, and that's what Israel needs now, that they have gone from being an orphaned people with no king to call their own or parent to call their own, no God in heaven to call their own. They are now his, and that's what they're doing now. They're now moving on with God, and God is going to do all the things that are indicative of, of, a, of a loving father and all the things that are indicative of a teacher king, teacher redeeming king, and all the things you would expect him to do. So there's seven points today, and they start like this. No sooner did God bring them out of harm's way than did he teach them. He started teaching them. As soon as he got them out of harm's way, he started teaching them. It's the first thing he does. Now, does he go find something that is greatly immoral about them and start there? No. He's so gentle. Look at how gentle he is. Let's go to the text, verses 22 through 25. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. They went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and they come up against a problem. They found no water. Their practical needs now are threatened. Verse 23, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. The word, the name Marah, M-A-R-A-H, means bitter. Okay? And the people grumbled. They grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Hey, what's a guy got to do? Verse 25, now just the first half of verse 25. And he cried to the Lord, and Moses cried to the Lord, and Yahweh showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So God's first lesson to Israel isn't about their great immorality and how messed up they are and how they need to get their act together. God's first act as their God is to provide for their practical needs. Isn't that what parents do? Does the baby come out of the womb and, hey, kid, hey, kid, listen, none of that crying now. I got some lessons to teach you. No, we spend the first couple years of their life doing almost nothing. We try to teach them, right? But their terrible twos finally force us to get our acting gear and start disciplining, right? I think that's why the terrible twos exist. <laughs> so we'll finally start doing the things we know we ought to do because the time of just practical needs has come to an end. Okay, but God cares for their practical needs. And he, this is not allegorical. Here's what I mean by that. Be careful when you're reading your Bible and you read something like this and you say, oh, surely the meaning is deep. I'll bet it's an illustration for the sweetness of what it means to walk with God or something like that. That's not what this means. This is just something that happened. God's caring for them. God knew a people need water. Do you need clean water? Do you think there'd be a city here if there was no clean water and no way to get clean water to St. Cloud? There would not be. God needs to uh, quench the, the practical thirst of his people and teaches us, them something here in the desert that they will need <laughs> for 40 years, actually, come to find out. Um, Ferdinand, de La, Ferdinand de Lesseps was the builder of the uh, Suez Canal, the portion of it that, that goes all the way through to the Mediterranean. And when he, back in those days, this, we're talking about the 19th century, I believe. I think it's the 19th century. Um, he tells a story of when he was doing this work, he went over there. He met some local Arab chiefs who told him there was a thorny bush. And he knew, likely, that this was a story from the Bible, and he made note of it. They told him there was a thorny bush that is indigenous to the area that if you toss it in your water, it will make it sweet. It was a natural sweetener. So whether that's a wives' tale or not, uh, it is likely God showed Moses a practical thing here. A certain tree that you might think is worthless, but if you can find this tree, you'll be able to have water anywhere, even if it's bitter water in the desert. So God takes care of their practical needs. So uh, I remember, this is more like um, my granddad when I was a little boy, just learning to, to walk, probably three or four, taking me around his 10 acres in outside of Ocala in a little town called Fairfield, and just Michael taking me around the farm and showing me this is what you do with the cows and this is how you get them to come and watch what happens when I, when I do this. And he'd 
take some hay under his arm and walk out to the feeder, and I'd just watch all the cows start to follow him. He was teaching me about the farm and what you can do to get animals to listen to you. If you want an animal to listen to you, if you need to get this cow out of this area of the pasture into this, he'll go for food. So you take some food with you, and he taught me practical things. This is God teaching his children practically like a dad does. Okay, dad takes his son to the backyard and says, don't touch that, it's poison ivy, right? Practical lessons from God. So God is immediately teaching them the importance of teaching, that it will be fundamental in his relationship with his people that he teach, they listen. That will be extremely important at Mount Sinai because the lessons are gonna get deeper and more complicated and the law is going to be so difficult to keep for them. Teaching will be central to their relationship, and they're finding it out first here at Mara, but they're learning the illustration that if we listen to God, things will get sweeter. I will let you go that far with your interpretation. If we listen to God, things get better. God doesn't just provide for our, pract- our, our uh, spiritual needs. He provides for our practical needs. He brought us out of slavery, and now he's giving us water, and he will give them bread soon. So he provides for the practical needs. When Jesus redeems a person out of sin, he, he, he doesn't just let us, okay, kid, I, 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 uh, my child, I, I saved you. Now go on and live your life. He immediately starts teaching you. It's the role that when you give your life to him, he becomes your rabbi. That's the primary way people saw him in the Gospels was as a Jewish rabbi. And everywhere he went, there was a lesson attached to what he did. He would heal people sometimes, not tell them why. The disciples would say, Master, why did you do what you did? And what did he have for him? A lesson. Everywhere he went was a lesson. At his own trial, he taught them that he is I am. He claimed to be Yahweh at his own trial. So he went down teaching. <laughs> He was a teacher to the end, and he's a teacher for us. He teaches you not to go any further in your life without his teachings. Why is there teaching in the center of Christian worship? You ever noticed? What's at the center of the room? It's not me. It's something that represents his teaching. Some lecterns and some traditions, I believe the Presbyterians are one of them, they leave a Bible on the pulpit at all times. Because the Bible is central to our worship. It's where he speaks to us. It's not me at the center of worship. It's God and his teaching at the center. You need God for every area of your life. I know I walked off camera. I apologize. You need God at the center of your life to teach you, not only to avoid bitter water, but to avoid bitter outcomes in your life. You need not motivational speech from me. You need God's own living word to guide you. So no sooner did God bring us out of harm's way by redeeming us from sin than did he begin teaching us, our great teacher. Number two, as soon as God brought Israel out of harm's way, he began testing them. He began testing them. He teaches a simple lesson, and then he progresses on to a deeper lesson, and with that lesson comes a test. Look at verses 25b through 27. 25, 7. There, where are we? Shur. We're in the wilderness of Shur. So there, the Lord made for Israel, made for them a statute and a rule. So did you know that he gave them a rule before Sinai? He did. He gave them their first rule in the wilderness of Shur. And, it was there, and there he did what? He tested them against this rule, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord our God, your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh, your healer. Then they came to Elam, so they moved to another place, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. One theologian says the timing of this first statute, which I recommend you underline in your Bible because it's, it's a precursor to Mount Sinai where he gives the whole law and he ratifies the Mosaic covenant with them. But this statute, this theologian says, highlights that with teaching comes testing. 
The teaching began small with a simple log in the water. And will you listen to me when it's for your own good? When you, will you listen to me when you need water to live? Will you listen to me when it's just my word, my commandment? Because this first commandment is not go love your neighbor. It's not don't murder. It's not don't be jealous, don't covet. It's will you listen to me? The first law is listen to me. It's almost like a commandment zero. Before the 10 came, listen is the first law that he gives them. He shows Israel, in the first point, he showed Israel that to move on into the desert and to move on toward the promised land, listening to his teaching is going to be for their very good. It's going to be, their life is going to depend on listening to his teaching. And here he shows them that, uh, or God foreshadows the nature of the covenant he's about to ratify with them. He's about to give them the law and say, being my people is dependent on you listening to my law. The old law, remember, remember when we were in Hebrews and, and the author of Hebrews said the covenant that Jesus made is a better covenant? And you might, you might remember that I said it's better because it's unconditional and it's secured in Jesus. This old covenant is dependent on whether they listen or not, if you will listen, if you will listen. So there's some conditionality. Theologians are divided on whether we should actually call it conditional because we see evidence of God's mercy stepping in when they break the commandments. Clearly, God is merciful, and he's merciful in this chapter, but it is a law that's based on whether they listen to it or not. So will you listen? In Deuteronomy 28, we hear the reverse of this. He said, if you don't listen, I'll do what? I might let pestilence call, come upon you. I might give you the same diseases that I gave to the Egyptians. In Deuteronomy 28, we read, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do the commandments and his statutes that I commanded to you today, then all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will strike you with boils, the boils of Egypt, and with the tumors and, and scabs and itch and uh, or, or an itch which cannot be healed, it says. God will let the same plagues fall upon you if you will refuse to listen to him. So there's some conditionality to this. Belonging to God doesn't mean coasting through life. I, don't, I think we got that somewhere in the mid-20th century. An easy, give your life to Jesus, everything gets better sort of Christianity. And it may be earlier in the 20th century too. Uh, with some other very popular teachers who did incredible things for, for the God. But something that came out of that time was this idea that my life need not change when I come to Jesus. They had to change everything about who they were. They lacked everything. And they realized by coming to God, they realized just how short they were. And when they received the law, they saw just how short all people fall of the glory of God. Sometimes God guides you to Mara. Listen closely. Sometimes in your life, God will guide you to a bitter place to make you grumble. Listen, I mean it. He did it for them. Why wouldn't he do it to you? Why couldn't he? He will lead you purposely to a bitter place. And you will grumble in order to find out that you're a grumbler. And if his will at that time for you is like what he does for them, he will show mercy, he'll reteach you the lesson, and he'll take you to the next point, the next stopping point for a, a, a lesson. Did you ever go on a field trip as a kid? And I'm not talking about the fun ones where you go to a theme park. I'm talking about the learning ones that not everyone was as excited for, where you went to a museum or something. And everyone was like, well, at least we don't have to go to school. But then when you got there, you found out they tricked us. This, this is all lessons. They're teaching us all day. And we don't even get to sit in our seat while they do it. Now we have to walk around and learn lessons. They tricked us into paying $20 to go to school today to go to a museum. Now, that was my outlook because that's the kind of student I was. I was looking for the easy way out when I was a little, little, little tyke. So you'll remember, you go to this location. They show you this exhibit. Your guide teaches you about that exhibit. And that's kind of how it is walking through life with God. You go to one place, the lesson is bitter. You go to, and then he says, here's the lesson, learn. 
Now next, and he guides you through the museum of your life to the next exhibit, to the next learning point, and you get there and there's something to learn, but sometimes we get to a place that's bitter and, we're, and we think, wait a second, I signed up for a fun, fun day. Not a day of teaching, not a day of bitterness. And I thought when I gave my life to Christ, everything would be gravy from then on. And then, I mean, I don't know how we could get that idea about God apart from just not reading our Bibles. You read your Bible and you find out God calls prophets who are prejudiced like Jonah. God calls prophets like Hosea who had an adulterous wife. God takes people and uses them who are the greatest of sinners like Paul and doesn't make life better. He takes them on journeys where they end up in prison by following Christ. So he's testing them. Will you listen is the question. Sometimes God takes you to a Mara, you grumble, you find out you're a grumbler, you repent, he has mercy, he gives you the grace of reteaching you the lesson, and then he takes you onward to the next stop. As soon as God brought Israel out of harm's way, number three, he began exhibiting mercy on them. He began exhibiting mercy on them. And I'll show you what I mean. They immediately need mercy. Look at verses, we're in chapter 16 now, look at verses one through eight. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people came to the wilderness of Sin. Now, I just want to say real quick, that is not an allegory, although they do sin in the wilderness of Sin. Okay, don't, don't think too much of it other than it'll help you remember that's where they stumbled and where they grumbled, okay? Which is between Elam and Sinai. We know they're on the way to Sinai eventually. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of God in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out of, into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. If only we had died with full bellies back in slavery. They literally, I mean, they, they worshiped at the Red Sea, and you do this too. You worship, and you go out there, you stumble, and you go, God! You can be in worship, and 10 minutes later, fighting with your spouse. I know it, because we're married too. <laughs> it's like, what happened? The Red Sea just happened, and I'm hungry, God! They're complaining, Here's, here's their response to God's test. They're grumbling. They complain against Moses and Aaron and wish they died as if God doesn't hear this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. In other words, before I give them the law, here's the test. Will you listen to me? So here's what they're going to do. Go out every day and gather bread. That, will, that I will reign from heaven. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people, at evening you shall go, you, uh, you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall not see I'm sorry, in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. For what, for what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, what are we that you grumble against us? Do you think we're in control here? Do you know who you're grumbling against actually? Self-serving. Do you know when you grumble against your elders, you're grumbling against God? Do you know that? I know that's a self-serving thing to say, but do you know that? Do you know that they're grumbling against God here? They say it to Moses and Aaron, and Mo Moses says, who are, you? who are we that you mumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you, or gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. So here they are. They are grumbling. They're grumbling. And they find out, uh-oh, we thought we were grumbling at them. We're really grumbling at the one who brought us out of Egypt. 
And we're really complaining about the predicament he's led us into because he put these guys in charge and he told these guys how to lead us. The second time they grumble, they find out it's against God. God is showing Israel that he is willing to exhibit mercy on their nastiest thoughts because he still feeds them. In their nasty, nasty, nastiness, God still feeds them. Does God say, well, if you're going to be that way, no bread for you? <laughs> no. He, he, he is being extremely merciful and gentle here. When I was a kid, I'd sometimes be at a friend's house, and that friend got really comfortable because I was over, and he thought he could get away with murder and disrespect his parents because you know, my parents aren't going to spank me while Mike's around. And they would, and my, my, and I know better. I know my dad would just. I know, I know better. My, oh, you want to be disciplined in front of your friend? Okay, tell him to get out of camera. Here it comes. So sometimes my friend would get a little mouthy and say something disrespectful to his parents, and I'd go, "That's it. Jimmy's dead. I'm going to see Jimmy die." I think Sinbad actually did this in his stand-up comedy. Like he talked about going over to a friend's house and he said, that's it, he's dead, we're done, I'm out. And he'd leave because he, like, surely I'm about to watch Jimmy die because he just spoke that way. And you no, know, in those moments, their parents were extremely merciful, but I still got the shivers. And if you hear them grumble against God and you get a little bit of the shivers, it's because you know what they deserve. After all that we've seen, you know what they deserve. And you know what a Christian saved by the grace of God deserves when they grumble against the same God who gave his only son. Does he need to give more to you than that? Grumbling against God after all he's done, is it, it should teach them something about themselves. They learned we're willing to do the complete opposite of what God says. We have it in us to point right back in his face and complain about menial things though he saved us from the major things. God was merciful. Christian, God has get forgiven you of more sins than you realize you've committed. God is extremely merciful. Israel did not deserve the Red Sea. They did not deserve to, be, to bear the name God's people. This is a reminder that God is merciful to those he chooses to be merciful with and is not dependent on anything, any merit in us because they did not have much merit within them and they're showing it here. God is profoundly loving and merciful and he proved it to you on a hill called Calvary. So number four, as soon as he brought them out of harm's way, he began giving them miraculous grace. He began giving them miraculous grace. Verses 9 through 21. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord. So does he shoo them away in their sin? He welcomes them closer. That is so merciful and gracious. For he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. So the cloud was there. Remember, this cloud guided them everywhere they went. But they looked at the cloud, and something unique came from it. And they could see this is the beauty of God. We're going to talk about the beauty of God maybe in two sermons at the end of this series when he comes down and fills the, the tabernacle and, and, and lives in the tabernacle, dwells in the tabernacle. But they can see the glory of the Lord in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard grum the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp. It's like the easiest hunting day ever. I mean, the animals come to us, there it is, kill it. Right? The, 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 the camp gets filled with quail. And in the morning, the, the dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flaky, fine, fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said, what is this? <laughs> For they expected bread. They expected something else, right? If anything, for they did not know what it was. And Moses said, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer, which is, think of it about the size of a two liter, 
about a two liter, come to find out. An omer, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat, like a buffet. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till morning. And what happened? Pay attention to this. Listen, it bred worms and it stank. So it rotted overnight. The shelf life was not good on this manna because God wanted them to eat and rely on him for their, literally, their daily bread. Give us this day our daily provision, okay? You walk with Jesus, he gives you what you need for today. If you don't know about tomorrow, wait till tomorrow. Go out in the morning and ask in prayer and God will guide you through that day, okay? So he, he um, this, this, this has a short, short shelf life and Moses was angry with them for, because of this. Morning by morning, they gathered it each as much as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. Does God leave their presence because of their grumbling? No. He manifests his presence all the more. I'm so glad that his grace in my life is not dependent on the moments I deserve it. Often he comes to me personally, I'll testify. He comes to me when I deserve it least. When I am at my worst and I say, why would you do this? And I'm reminded, his has said for me, his faithful love is not dependent on me, but on his good, gracious nature. Uh, before I knew we were going to sing <laughs> Grace Greater Than Our Sin, I planned to use it as an illustration. Then I, we sang it this morning, and I laughed out loud. The words are beautiful. Marvelous grace of our loving God. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. God shows Israel that with belonging to God comes a measure of grace you could never earn in all your years. The bread was grace. In verse 31, they're going to tell us what it tastes like. Do you ever, I mean, maybe you visit, maybe you've missed this in all your time reading this story. It tasted like honey. And it was basically honey grams from heaven. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what they were complaining about, frankly. I'm one of these dads who, when my wife buys our kids the snacks that are for them, you will find me grabbing that and hiding it in my office and eating it during the day as a snack. Honey grams are delicious. Delicious. Um, and I don't know why I'm throwing that in here. I just felt we needed to, <laughs> needed to acknowledge this was a blessing. And God didn't have to make it taste good. He could have let them drink bitter water and, and moldy stale bread and made them responsible for themselves. But when you take an orphan and make them yours, you care for all the things they know not how to care for themselves. God was extremely merciful. Christian, remember that God's grace is not evidence you're doing something right. It is a byproduct of his, his said toward you, his faithful, undying love for you, his devoted, faithful love. So number five, as soon as he brought them out of harm's way, he began revealing his personal nature to them. They already know his name, which you remember from early in the sermon series is a profound miracle to know the name of God, the personal name of God. But he begins revealing something about his nature, more about his nature to them. Look at verses 22 through 26. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning. Now, I told you to remember that verse from the last section. If they keep it till morning, what's supposed to happen? It's supposed to rot. And now here they seem to get 
um, an amendment to that, another rule, do not boil, do not bake on the day of rest. That would be working. Instead, bake double on the sixth day, collect double, bake and boil double, and keep it till the next day. Well, in some of their minds, they're likely thinking, we know what will happen, it will go bad. Keep, keep following. So they laid it aside till morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will find out, or find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none that morning. So if you are disobedient on the sixth day, you're going to be real hungry on the seventh day, in other words. This is profound. So let me start here. Genesis hasn't been recorded. This people doesn't know the creation account yet. God will tell Moses, very likely, church tradition holds it, that Moses wrote all five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Genesis hasn't been written. It was written by God telling Moses how God created the world, and Moses wrote it down for future generations to know. They don't know the creation account yet. God hasn't done that yet. It happened either at Sinai or sometime after Sinai, where God gave, um, depending on which side of the argument you're on, at Sinai or sometime along the way that God was telling Moses these stories about the flood and everything. But they didn't know how creation happened. They have no context to understand a seventh day of rest. Most of you went, yeah, seventh day of rest, the Sabbath, the seventh day, it's a day of rest. I rest because God rested on the seventh day of creation. They had no context for this. They haven't understood it yet. Eventually they will, but God's already revealing something about his nature and the history of the world to them. Eventually this will make more sense when they get the Genesis creation account, but God's revealing his personal nature as a God who rested. And he tells them, set aside a day of the week, consecrated for me, a day of rest. The day is set aside for me. Your mind will be set aside for me. You will do no work and you will remember me on that day. He's giving them like a culture here. He's making them a people group with common um, routines and rhythms of life common rituals that they will carry out in worshiping their God and in remembering their God. A couple things to point out. On verse 23, they're not allowed to cook. How will they eat? Verses 25 and 26, you saw that they are a God. He did not bend the Sabbath rule. In other words, in order to feed them every day, he wasn't, God was not going to bend the Sabbath rule and work on the seventh day. Did you see that? Because that might be what a human would think. If you're going to feed us every day, feed us 365 days a year. Well, that's our calendar. But feed us every day of the week. They might have thought, just feed us on the seventh day. God was not going to bend his rule. He was not going to bend the Sabbath rule in order to provide for them. Instead, what does he do? He provides a miracle to make the food from the sixth day be the only food that can last two days. Make twice as much on the first day, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. That food will not last till morning. But God steps in and provides a miracle that allows them to be obedient. He changes something biological about the food, the manna that came on the sixth day from heaven and they collected it. That food is the only food that can last two days. That says something profound about you and your struggles against sin. When you're chasing after holiness and holiness doesn't seem attainable, obedience doesn't seem attainable, here he provides the miracle for their obedience. Because from their point of view, they couldn't have been obedient to this without starving that seventh day. And God still provides for them. Christian, God provides what is necessary for your holiness. He provided his son. And in two things as part of that, God condemned his son so he wouldn't have to condemn you. Did you hear me? He condemned his son so he need not condemn you. When you sin, remind yourself you are not condemned for it now. Through faith in Christ, you are, not, you are no longer condemned for your sin. Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore... No condemnation in Christ, our Lord. 
there is no condemnation. So remind yourself of that, number one. God's abundant mercy, God's nature, is that when he puts his condemnation on his son in exchange for you, he no longer condemns you. So let not your continued sin condemn you. And number two, Jesus lived the law perfectly. He faced every temptation you do and withheld it and died a spotless, blameless lamb. So he empathizes with what you struggle against. Regardless what it is, he empathizes with it. And he survived it. So he's the only expert in the entire cosmos who knows how to avoid that sin you struggle with. And yet some of you shrink away in shame from him. The only one who knows how to help you survive and remain obedient when that temptation comes. He's your only practical answer for being obedient to God. By wiping away your sin debt that you need not feel condemned and then being your rabbi to teach you. Praise God. As soon as he brought them out of harm's way, number six, he began correcting their missteps. He began correcting their missteps. Verses 27 through 30. On the seventh day, some people went out to gather. Did you hear it? That's the impatience I would have if I were Moses. But look how God responds. On the seventh day, some of them went out to gather anyways, but they found no manna. What happened? And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Do not go outside on the second day. You ever had to reteach your child something and it's a lot of this? Okay, that's, that's the human. Remember, that is not God coming out of me. That's a father, an earthly, fleshly, impatient father coming out of me. God patiently reteaches them the lesson. The creator of the universe patiently reteaches them the lesson. Read verses 28 through 30, and then go back up to the previous section of God talking. He just says it again. Stay in your home. A little more explicit this time. Stay in your home. Do not go outside on the seventh day. Okay. Again, there's that father in me coming out. And Moses said to Aaron, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, end of verse 32. Right? Uh, no, we're only supposed to go to 26. Uh, 26. I've gone way beyond it at this point. So six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, you will, there will be none. And then down in verse 29 is where he says, remain each of you in your home, and he just patiently reteaches them the lesson yet again. Like toddlers who obey, who disobey rules, God has to kind of go, no, nope, come on, we'll get there eventually, and be gentle with them, and a perfect example of a loving, patient God who just diligently teaches the lesson. But remember back in the beginning, what was the first statute? If you will listen to me, if you will listen to me, and God guides them to a place called sin to let them learn about their sin, that, wow, we have a propensity for not listening. So that first statute is already proving to be an issue for us. And if not for his grace and mercy, withholding what we deserve, which is punishment now for being disobedient, and giving us what we don't deserve, honey grams from heaven, if, if not for the grace and the mercy of God, they're learning about his nature, that despite the condition of the covenant, he is still an abiding, loving, faithful God who is able to muster patience no human could with their children. God shows Israel that he repurposely redeemed a disobedient people. 
he purposely redeemed from Egypt, from slavery, a disobedient people. And he personally involves himself in their missteps. When they mess up, he doesn't go, good luck, and walk away. He gets involved and reteaches and guides and reteaches and provides uh, sweetness for the water and he provides for their needs and guides them to the next step. They're seeing something about his abiding love in this text that is beautiful. And he provides what's necessary for their obedience. When you give your life to Christ, don't expect him to absolve you of your sin and send you on your, on your merry way. He will get involved in your missteps too. That's number six. He will get involved in your missteps. Can we put that on the screen? He, he will get involved in your missteps and guide you beyond your missteps to make you more like he designed you to be before sin wrecked you. God has replaced himself, or God has been replaced in the minds of many people with a false idol of a God who fully approves of everything you are. Do you hear what I said? I want to say that again because it's a complicated sentence, but it's true. In many minds, the one true God has been replaced with a false idol of someone who just approves of everything I do. Less a God and more of just a supporting yes man he gets involved in missteps. He points them out for our good because he knows they lead to destruction and they're part of the path that destruct, to the destruction that we were originally on and that he pulled us off of. Jesus is a corrector of missteps. Remember what I told you, his primary identity for the people who met him on earth, for them, was a teacher. So number six, he began correcting their missteps in addition to revealing his nature to them. And lastly, he began providing for their long stay in the desert. He began providing for their long stay in the desert. 31 through the end of the chapter. Now the house of Israel called its name manna, called this bread manna. It was like coriander seed, not in taste, but in look. It was white and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. On that note, uh, I grew up eating honey grams at my grandma's house, or honeycomb. There's honey in everything. This is just so exciting for me, <laughs> clearly. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded, let the omer of it be kept throughout the generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar, this omer is about a two liter, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before God to be kept throughout the generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony. They put it in the ark. They put it in the ark. Placed it before the testimony when the ark was created. Placed it, so we, what we just read is future events. This is future events, okay? The Ark has not been created yet. There will be an Ark of the Covenant. And if you think that's just from Indiana Jones, that's based on a real thing, okay? That's not a joke. I know we get a lot of our truth from media and movies and what we grow up with, but the Ark of the Covenant was something that God gave them. So when it exists, on top of it will be a two cherubim, and in between them is the place called the mercy seat. That's the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. So they're gonna put this before the testimony, so it will be kept with the Ten Commandments because God wants them to remember the manna that they ate. It's important that they remember God's provision in the desert. The people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer, is, and then a little footnote in verse 36, and Omer is a tenth part of an ephah. And that's how I figured out eventually that it's about a two liter. So from verses 34 and onward, we're reading meta narrative. This is all narrative. And then in here, in the middle of this chapter, Moses, who wrote, recorded this, inserts something that is not happening in the wilderness of sin, and it's commentary on how they're going to continue eating this for the next 40 years. And if you were just reading this like a narrative, you'd think, wait a second, they've only got to go a couple hundred miles, 40 years. What happened? If you don't know, they're going to wander in the desert for 40 years. 
Today's sermon is the final sermon before we will pause for the Advent season and preach Advent messages, and we'll return to this book in January, uh, the third Sunday in January, to continue on in, in chapter 17 and forward. But this ending here is profound. It's the greatest cliffhanger, and I didn't realize it till I was standing right here. How in the world do we go from, great, we learned some lessons, and we're leaving the wilderness of sin with everything we need to know? Teaching, listen to God, testing, survive the test, grace and mercy are supreme. We got everything we need because they're heading to a place called Sinai and God will give them the full law. And while Moses is on the hill receiving the law, they will be at the base of the mountain building a false idol of a calf made of gold under Aaron's watch. And they will so break what is becoming this beautiful covenant that God will make two generations die out in the desert before he finally takes this people into the land he promised them. There's a lot that's going to happen at the end of the book. But God provides here. And in this chapter, he does provide not just the things they'll need in the desert, wandering and waiting for the time when God says, go into the promised land, which I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they are leaving with everything they're going to need beyond that. Everything that the church, that the, the kingdom is going to need into the New Testament age. And everything that we need, we need the teaching of God. We need the testing of God to expose in us that the work is not yet completed, that he wants to perform in us to change us from the inside out. And now because we live in history where we live, we know who he's conforming us to be like because we've read about the man from Galilee, the perfect man, the perfect God man who, who loved people, loved people, loved people right to death. If you give your life to Jesus, he will never leave you nor forsake you. And even though these people will commit sin at Mount Sinai, he will not leave them because he has said, I will be your God. He will not forsake them. And in fact, we read it in Deuteronomy 31, 8. This is, this is the, the final commandment before going into the promised land. The, this is the God. This is the same God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Chapter 16 is a remarkable read considering what we know is ahead for these people. Even when they commit All the sins at Sinai, God will not leave them nor forsake them. He came to die. Jesus came to die the death we deserve. That a billion failures around the world, throughout human history, have deserved. God wants you. I hope you see that. This is the nature of a God who chases down the sinner. This is the nature of a God who chases down the sinners, redeems them from captivity, and and pleads with them and shows them abundant mercy over and over and over again, pleading that they would come to belief in him and give their lives over to him. And the, the supreme way he did that is in the giving of his son. And it demonstrates that he wants you. He doesn't need you. He didn't need them. But he still, in his love, wants them and wants you. It is almost always true. It is almost always true that when someone first hears about the salvation offered through Jesus, in their initial reaction, the knee-jerk reaction is always this, whether it's verbalized or it's somewhere deep within a dark place we don't want to acknowledge, there's this place within us where our our knee-jerk reaction is, but look at who I am. It's because he doesn't know the real me. If you knew the real me, he wouldn't have let anybody die for me. Look at all I am not. Look at all I lack. Unbeliever in this room today, look at all Israel was not. Look at all Israel lacked. God doesn't send his son to die because a bunch of people deserve it. Jesus, throughout his ministry, said things like, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. He came for the weak. He came for the poor. He came to set captives free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If you want to know whether God would accept you to look at Israel and walk with Israel throughout this book, and you'll see the great mercy 
abundant mercy of the Lord. I'll close with these lyrics that came to me, that, re- that dawned on me because they are so fitting for where we end today with this seeming lame duck nation, <laughs> this, this, this lame people. And by lame, I don't mean losers. I mean lame, disabled. They are in, a, in uh, incapable to be obedient, this lame people. I was reminded of lyrics from the rapper Lecrae, and I will not rap it, I'll just read it. (laughs) Yeah, no, Rob. (laughs) They said you came for the lame. I'm the lamest. I made a mess, but you said you'll erase it. I'll take it. They say you came for the lame. I'm the lamest. I broke my life, but you said you'll replace it. I'll take it. And Father, I pray I pray, I pray this morning for anyone who feels that they've broken their life, they've messed up beyond repair, that they have grumbled against you and stumbled the way these people did in the wilderness of sin. And maybe someone here this morning thinking, I lived the whole life of sin. I am the embodiment of the wilderness of sin. Walking with these people through this desert. I mean, they've been in the desert less than a couple of months and we already see they're just like us. They're our brothers in the flesh, our sisters in the flesh, capable of grumbling against a mighty, loving God who put breath in our lungs this morning. And sometimes we use that breath to grumble right back at him about the things we don't have, that we don't trust him for. Father, for anyone in this room who knows they've never committed their life to you, they've never just drawn a line in the sand, walked across the line and said, that's it, from this day on, my heart belongs to God, my life belongs to God. Make that this morning, Father. Make that this moment. Make this moment their moment to believe, to trust, and to walk with God, to profess, I know I'm lame, but you came to set captives free. You came for the slaves. You came for the lame. You came for the lowly, you came from the, you came from people that thought they were rejects. You went right to them. You went right to the sinners and you dined with them and you washed their feet and you went right to the cross for them. Your love is profoundly mysterious and yet so simple. And you said it in this, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for a brother. And you laid yours down for us, Jesus. Help new believers to believe it this morning. And for those who believe, just to be washed. In your love, washed in bewilderment as we just marvel at your glorious grace again. It never grows old. May it never grow old. Thank you for Israel. Thank you that they are our forefathers in the faith and that through their stumblings we can see our own and learn to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.